Rick has devoted his career to designing more economically and environmentally sound neighborhoods by developing new technologies, techniques, and training programs. Rick developed a score, score of, of innovations leading to the suburban alternative to, quote, smart growth in his book, which he will have here. There it is. Prefurbia, Reinventing the Suburbs from Disdainable to Sustainable. So please welcome Rick Harrison. Uh, thank you. Uh, my presentation is going to be a little bit different than what you've seen. It's going to be fast-paced, and uh, I thought it was going to be 45 minutes, and I told it was going to be 20, so I cut it down. The original longer presentation is downloadable uh, from American Dream, and a lot more information is in uh, the book. Uh, I've been in this business uh, almost 50 years. And I can tell you one thing that's been the same for 50 years has always been a war between the urban and the suburbs. The difference is the urbanites want to force their way of life. You never see the suburbanites want to force the urbanites to the other way. And uh, this conversation will be the same 50 years from now and 50 years later. Uh, one thing, in 1993, I started this business around then. LEED started then. Congress of New Urbanism started then. So it all started in 93. Uh, Kunstler put the attack on the car that the liberals uh, latched onto, but with the new innovations and progress, is the car really the problem? So uh, we've had a 100-year passion for the car. We're going to have a 100-year more passion unless something else comes up. We are uh, dependent upon it for our freedom, and we're passionate about it. The reality is uh, we do suburban planning. That's what we do. It's developer-based. So that means that everybody thinks the only thing a developer wants to do is make some money and go on to the next project. The people who design it are... Uh, think that in order to squeeze every possible unit, they will take every minimum dimension and shoehorn the stuff together. Almost never is there a consideration for the quality of life of the residents, and I'll get more into that. And they're designed by civil engineers. Why? Because the civil engineer, if they do the planning and throwing it for free, they're going to get real lucrative fees for the civil engineering. Most of the homes are not done by architects. Most of them in the sub suburbs are designed by draftsmen or uh, house designers. There's a big difference there. Smart growth. And I'm going to base this on Denver Stapleton, which really isn't smart growth, but it's we're here. Uh, developer base. There's a question mark. Very few new urban or smart growth developments do the initial developer make a profit. They go bust, the next developer who buys the project at pennies on the dollar makes the money. It reduces the city minimums. So not only do they want to squeeze people to the minimums, all of them say the minimums aren't minimal enough, we need even more minimal. That's true with all of them. It is social engineering. It assumes the residents will change their way of life and it is promoted by architects. This is a very important thing that I'm going to kind of close with, why, why that's important. So what we did, and, and this is going to be different than any presentation I've done here in the past, is we replicated the mathematics by digitizing a section, a big enough section, this section of Denver Stapleton, to run some numbers. And is it really environmentally friendly and economic, as the proponents say? So we ended up with uh, this much information. So let's look at the environmental impact. The environmental impact is basically how much hard surface does the rain hit when it falls off. It's a flat site. It's an airport. There's not much topo there. So we can't talk about saving the trees and the hills because there wasn't any. 65.4% of the test area, and that's conservative, it's actually more than that, uh, but is man-made stuff. That means uh, the rest of it is green area. Off of 217 estimated units, at 6.2 units per acre in that test area. The car pavement per unit, that means the streets 
basically is 1,775 square foot. That includes streets, alleys, driveways per unit. This will come to play a little bit later. Side sidewalks of 424 square foot. And the green area, that's total green area, including the green in the islands in the street, is 2414 square foot per unit. Park, well, there's no park in that area, at least that area, so it's zero square foot. And I'm going to compare that to a project that the first phase is uh, just built. It just got sold out. Uh, the developer is... Um, Bison Development, uh, it is their fastest selling project. We designed it using methods uh, in the book, Perfervia. We're doing uh, three projects for them. And I'm not going to go too much into the methods because of time, but I'm going to go into differences in numbers. This is a suburban development in Colorado Springs. It's for middle income, uh, mostly military families that want a yard for the kids to play. Uh, the impervious surface went down from 65% in Stapleton to 40% uh, in uh, Forest Meadows. We only have 4.3 homes per acre, which is still fairly high density, and 316 units on that site. Interestingly, the area for pavement, even though it has these homes have two and three car garages, and all that driveway that's in front of the home. Uh, the square foot of pavement per home is within a few square foot of the square foot of pavement for cars per home as Stapleton. Um, it's incredibly connected. I'm going to get more into this in a minute. The area of walk per home is actually about a third less, but it's more walkable in almost every direction. And you'll understand that in a minute. Three times the green space per home, the actual green space. So when rain hits the hard surfaces, it actually has enough greenery that it helps absorb that rainfall so you don't have the runoff, that extreme runoff. Now what's interesting is the next project that they're building will be totally low impact. So not only will the rain be absorbed within the site, it will be treated very little runoff for middle-income average neighborhoods and much more open space. Total park area per home, 742 square foot. Compare that to zero square foot in um, Stapleton. So we, we took a look at a Stapleton house. Uh, just off the Internet, picked this one up, $405,000, and so... The suburban development with all these extra yard space and everything, that's got to be more expensive, right? So we took a home that is being built in the Trails Forest Meadows, and it looks quite a bit like the house that's in Stapleton, except this one's bigger because it's got the two-car garage on the side and stuff like that. Both built in 2014. We got an extra half a bath, an extra bedroom. And so it's got to be more expensive, right? Because it's well, it's a lot bigger. And that's the base home. That's the base home. If they finish the lower level, it goes over 5,000 square foot. And it's not much more money. So you got 33% more home for 24% less cost. And if you look at them, they're pretty similar in, in look. What's Perfervia? We, we like to think of it as a smarter suburban alternative. The resident is what you thought of in design. What's happened in this industry for the last 40 years since computer-aided drafting, in particular AutoCAD and its add-ons, has been an attitude, we have the automation, we can knock the subdivision out fast. It used to take about a month to hand calculate a 100-lot development. I can hand calculate, I could go into AutoCAD and with a software and calculate it. They, they'll post it in like a minute. So, what we have done is uh, develop this company. We're an offshoot of a software company. We're a design firm that was, it was developed so that we do the job better, not faster. Use the technology to discover new ways to develop land. And put the resident first. You put the resident first, and then you put every, everybody else benefits. Uh, 
we've been able to do that by exceeding, not asking for less minimums. We exceed the minimums in almost every case. Much less environmental impact, safer, healthier, less uh, infrastructure is the big thing. I live in Minneapolis. I live in a gridded neighborhood. If I want to go to the lake, the shortest distance is right on my street and go to the lake, right? If I want to go to one of the two restaurants, the shortest distance is actually quite right, you know, to the restaurant. I can't go that route because I have to walk the grid. It's either a half a mile more or two-thirds of a mile more for that trip and the walk because of the grid. The grid is only efficient if the destination is on the street that you are also on. Once you start having to do the zigzag pattern, the grid gets less efficient. So part of the proverbia of... Uh, planning theory is when you have a raw piece of land, which new development's raw piece, draw the trails first. Design where the destinations are, go straight to them, and design around it. That's never been done in planning before, that attitude. That guarantees walkability. Examples, over here in Fountain, Colorado, a circle. Main circle, all the walks lead to it. You wanna go for a run, you'll end up right back to where you were, that type of thing. This is uh, two hours from here. Cabela's World Headquarters is in Sydney, Nebraska. Truly awful place to live. They can't get good people in because there's no place, so they're building their own town. This started as a new urban development. Phase one is right there. It's, in the, it's going in the ground right now. 27% uh, less pavement. Um, this is in Vieira. I'll talk a little bit more about Vieira. It's uh, probably the most advanced neighborhood in the United States when it gets built next year, and you'll discover why. Um, again, it started new urban, like uh, Cabela's, 27% less, no, 38% less infrastructure. Um, this will, should be under construction uh, right after the first of the year. Or we're going to follow topography will create a linear uh, park system along uh, the, the uh, trail system. But these are much more walkable than new urban developments. In other words, instead of saying the suburbs are bad, and that's it, why don't we just fix it? Why don't we take the problems and fix it? And then make the suburbs great places to live. Not every place has sidewalks, as you can see here or here. Um, I won't work on a development. I'll refuse to unless there's a walk system because um, this is not good. It, it, it's just something that functions well. Most cities require a four-foot wide walk to be built on both sides of the street. That is the entire walk in suburbia and in the urban areas. That is the entire trail plan within the development, nothing else. Take your offset button in AutoCAD and you got your walks. No work for it. Four foot wide is too narrow to be usable. And that's why in this new urban development, you've got someone running the street. We recommend walks five or six foot wide so that couples will actually be on the walk instead of using the street. And we'll meander the walk. It's another little attention to detail. It makes the neighborhood look prettier and better and more inviting. And it's like fancy wheels on the cars. Same car, it just looks better. And instead of building streets for emergency access, we could build walks. Just wider walks, this, this uh, walk right through here. Uh, otherwise, we would have had to build a street for emergency vehicles and all the setbacks and everything else that happens, it just eats up land. Walks can serve the same purpose. So there's a lot more to walks. This is just my cliff note version. So let's take a look at vehicular connectivity, it's something that we call flow. This is the before plan of the actual of a, a site in New Mexico. What we look for in flow is when you enter that development to get home with one turn or less and maintain traffic flow. I'm going to give you some examples why that's important. Well, I have five more. I'm on 15, really. Okay, the grid is going to have 50% uh, uh, of the people are going to have to stop. We know a body in motion tends to stay in motion. It takes 
so you have to get that car moving to that 25, 30 mile an hour speed and then to a stop, that takes 400 feet. So when you look at a fit grid, is it really efficient? Uh, most of the case it's not. You're always in the stop, accelerate type mode. Very inefficient. So what we try and do is create a pattern that you know we, we can get to the neighborhood fast. Um, this is uh, Viera. It was a new urban plan. That was the original plan. This is the uh, plan that's going to get built. 38% less road, same density. This is what it would have looked like. These are the actual 35-foot wide Viera homes. This is what it will look like when it's built, exact same density. So the sustainability formula is reduce the road, increase the open space. That's not easy to do, and that's why new urbanism is braced. It's, it's, it's very elementary, it's very easy, and a politician can, uh, can grasp that. Just real quick, um, we're in a new era, and this is uh, Viera, where they're shaping the homes to the lots. In other words, they can get a much wider home than they can on a rectangular lot and make that home much more attractive, more livable, more functional, because once we go high density, we get narrow and the home becomes less functional. So Vieira is the first development in the United States, probably in the world, that we've coordinated architecture, what's going on the inside of the home to the outside, so we are coordinating those functions. And we've been doing that in a product that we call the Bay Home for years, uh, but this will be the first, these are bay homes, this will be the first uh, subdivision that has that uh, function in the United States. Now, what's interesting is a developer here in Denver, they are going to be doing that on their future developments. They're going to shape their homes. And uh, we just talked with D.R. Horton, and they're interested in doing that too. Am I out of time? Okay. I'm going to close this. That stuff's in the book, Preferbi. I'm going to show you something a little different. The reason we're able to do uh, numbers that other people can't do is we've got technology that allows us to measure um, the efficiency of a development. No one else has that technology. We, we, we uh, designed it, so it's as easy as that. And if I wanted to take that further and really see what Stapleton looked like, built, what I could do is simply press a button and then we're using video game graphics. And we've developed all this technology the last eight years. And you'll be able to see what the sites really look like and not have some drawing and imagine what it'll look like. So there'll be no fakery anymore in planning. And that's a problem with planning. As far as architects, um, Man, I'll tell you, uh, Stapleton is a real a boon to them because they'll get all those fees. They don't get it in the suburbs. It's not affordable. Uh, this is how a typical subdivision plat is submitted in a typical city. So people can't judge anything on the way it looks. If I take this, and add some color, that's kind of nice, but see, people can't visualize what it'll look like built. So when you take and uh, take a look at this Forest Meadows and then compare it to Stapleton, and you look at the economics, which I didn't have time to get into, uh, it's a completely different lifestyle. Stapleton is not new urban, it's not smart growth. There are no coffee shops to walk to. It's, it, is, it is a TND, it's a grid, and it's not mixed income, and th this is a, more of a choice for the American future. It's much more efficient than what they're building now, and a developer can reduce the cost a lot by two, three thousand dollars $3,000. That could go into the home and the landscaping, and then uh, you end up even with something better. We take the negative parts about suburbia, get rid of them, enhance them, and we're blacklisted everywhere that there's a new urban plan because they don't want to get this message out. Congress New Urbanism has about 300 projects since 1993. That's the entire new urban movement. We have 900 projects since 1993. They have 
thousands and thousands of people. They're politically tied. We have nobody funding us, and we have five people. And we don't, we're not in the news everywhere, but uh, it, just to give you an idea of where we're at. What's that? Okay, just want to point out one thing at the end. Thank you. Um, I'll get this back up. There's something I wanted to end with to point out, and I'll go right to the end here. Um, thank you. So this is really how the suburbs are being built. Actually, how New Urban is built. You know, and, and so we're looking at uh, something that is, is a much brighter future. Uh, technology has been the problem. Uh, it, this type of planning, advanced planning, is not taught. It's as if we're using the Etch-a-Sketch. Consultants do not communicate with each other. There's no collaboration, no communication between engineers, architects, planners. Universities do not teach collaboration. They teach existing CAD technologies, and they teach in their social engineering. The software industry, and we're in it, and we hope to be in a big time when this comes out, is a multi-billion dollar industry. They have done nothing to make any of our lives better. Um, and just That's my, my thing about uh, uh, the software. We've been working for the day past decade on training and technology that will bring the consulting industry together, working on university courses that will get all the different departments together and, you know, uh, hopefully tone down the social engineering. And uh, right now it's unlimited distribution for a couple years. Uh, so why is new urbanism much more expensive? Uh, here's one thing: the architect is a good, you know, about seven to fifteen percent of that home goes into architectural fees. Uh, when you look at the uh, per acre uh, square footages of surfaces, all of that costs money. If I put that in numbers, and I don't know what it costs per acre here. Let's say fifty thousand uh, dollars. What you've got is not much difference between Forest Meadows and Stapleton. For two thousand hours more, you get three times a lot. You know, you, you be your own judge on that. You know what's happening. I, I, I'm just, I just report the facts. So, anyhow, thanks.